Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to church this morning. The hot week that we're having, for those who are watching online, we welcome you as well. And uh, it's good to be here this morning. Um, <clears throat> we just want to direct you, if you are uh, new to CFA, we want to direct you to check out our website, cfachurch.ca, and uh, we invite you to fill out the um, connection form there. We'd like to say hello to you. So if you are watching and you're new to CFA, just... Uh, check out our website, connect with us, feel free to comment, and uh, we will be in touch with you. Uh, some things that you need to know uh, at CFA this week. The first, this is the final week of our 40 days of prayer, uh, the stand, 40 days of prayer that we've been doing, uh, and it leads up to Canada Day. And so we're going to continue with our prayer times this week. Um, we've got a prayer time at 1 after the service today, at noon on Tuesday, uh, Wednesday morning at 7, and uh, we encourage you to take time to attend one of those events. And then on Canada Day, um, wherever you're celebrating Canada Day, we encourage you to take time with the friends and family that you're celebrating with and take time to pray on Canada Day and to, uh, to, to look at um, what it is that, that God is calling us to as church within our nation and to consider that as we close out this week or this 40 days of prayer and fasting. Also for VBS, our VBS launch is just a few weeks away. Uh, this year it's, it's going to be flexible due to the online nature and so we encourage you to sign up for that if you haven't done so already. And then finally, uh, next Sunday is I guess re-opening day, although it's not really re- <laughs> Uh, so next Sunday, we're um, one service at 10 a.m., uh, and you don't have to pre-register. Uh, you'll come until it's full, and, uh, and if we fill up uh, that one service, we'll look at it adding a second service. Uh, but as we go to one service, our one service Sunday is always 10 a.m., so 10 a.m. next Sunday, uh, all, all restrictions will be lifted. One thing that we're asking, though, is that everybody's in a little different place. Uh, we were reading an article this week, 69% of Canadians are leery about returning back to kind of life as normal. And so keep that in mind as you come in. And some of you are going to want to hug and kiss everybody. Some people are not going to want to do that. And so, so be mindful of your neighbor. Love your neighbor by, you know, maybe if you really want to give them a hug, say, is it okay if I give you a hug? Uh, some people will be okay with that and some people won't. And that's, that's okay. We want to make this a great place for people who want to hug and people who still want to, I need, I need a little bit more time yet. And that's okay. Uh, but we're going to celebrate together next Sunday, and uh, it's going to be good. So we invite you to join us. We will still be online as well, and we're going to continue our online presence. For those who uh, will, are not in the area or who want to continue to watch online, we're going to be online next Sunday as well. And so we're looking for, forward to celebrating together next week. So let's stand together. Let's pray as we move into a time of worship this morning. Holy Spirit, we thank you, God, that you are with us, that you are in our midst as we worship you this morning. Your presence uh, is, is already here. You were here long before we, before we entered the building like this. You go with us. You came with us in the vehicles as we drove here. Uh, Lord, as we worship you, help us to realize that we are in your presence, that you are our Heavenly Father, that you love us immensely, that you have things you want to communicate to us. And so, Lord, I pray that we would open our hearts and our minds and our spirits to you, that we would hear your voice as you speak to your people. Meet us where we are, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Cast my cares aside, leaving my past behind, set my heart and mind on you. Reaching my hand to yours, believing there's so much more, knowing that all you have in store for me is good. 
It's good. Today is the day you have made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Today is the day you have made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And I won't worry about tomorrow. I'm trusting in what you say. Today is the day. Today is the day. Fears aside, leaving my doubts behind, giving my hopes and dreams to you, Jesus. I'm reaching my hands to yours, believing me so much more, knowing that all you have in store for me is good. It's good. Today is the day. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Today is the day you have made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And I won't worry about tomorrow. I'm trusting in what you say. Today is the day. Today is the day. And I will stand upon your truth part and all my days I'll live for you all my days I'll live for you I will stand upon your truth all my days I'll live for you all my days I'll live today is the day you have made I will rejoice and be glad in it Today is the day you have made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And I won't worry about tomorrow, giving you my fears and sorrows. Where you lead me, I will follow. I'm trusting in what you say. Today is the day. Today is the day. Today is the day. The day. Yeah. Oh God, you've been so good to me. Every day I wake up, I breathe another breath of your mercy. And you never count my sins against me You got me dancing And now I'm shouting You got me leaping And now I'm spinning hallelujah Oh, oh, oh you're so good to me You're so good to me you're so good to me Oh God You've been so good to me Every day I wake up I breathe another breath of your mercy Oh God You've been so good to me My delight is in you Cause I know that your hand is upon me You got me dancing And now I'm shouting You got me leaping And now I'm spinning hallelujah Oh, oh, oh you're so good to me You're so good to me You're so good to me Jesus, you're the one Myself for me, so I will be the one to praise you in the streets. Oh, 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 you're 
You're so good to me. 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 Psalm 145, 3 through 7. Great is the Lord, and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works. And I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up, Till I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend I have lived in the goodness of God And all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I make I will see of the goodness of God Your goodness is running after, it's running after your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. And all my life you have been faithful. Every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. He became 
our sin that we might become his righteousness he humbled himself and carried the cross love so amazing love so Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from hell. Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. His body the bread, His blood the wine, broken and poured out all for love. The whole earth trembled and the veil was torn. Love so amazing, Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sin. seated.
First of all, to one of my beloved sons, in whom I am well pleased, happy birthday, Russell. <laughs> Jesus was Russell's age when he began his ministry that changed the world and that changed our lives. It's hard to imagine that your son is the age, I mean, Russell, like that's how old Jesus was when he started his ministry. And you look at the ministry of Jesus, it's spectacular. And Russell could be entering that right now. So, so you know, better get at her there, Russell. <laughs> Most every day, each of us, and probably for all of you who are here today, probably with a few exceptions who live close enough to walk, uh, you were transported to this destination and to the places that you go to through a vehicle of some kind. Uh, we don't just put those vehicles in gear. We don't just start them up and put them in gear and let them go, do we? It doesn't work that way. It's one of the reasons uh, we aren't supposed to text and drive. We're supposed to be paying attention to what we're doing. We're supposed to be watching the drivers around us and driving according to the weather conditions. And if it's raining or snowing, if there's black ice on the road or if there's a, a, a torrential downpour or hail or, I mean, we just have to be ready. And then there's all the other drivers on the road as well. And so uh, it's very difficult uh, to, to drive and it requires our full attention. How many of you know that? Do you know that there's even laws? How many of you have had a ticket for distracted driving? They'll give you a ticket if they don't feel like your full attention is on what you're doing. And I think that that's probably usually deserved. And I think I'm glad that there's a ticket for that. It makes me not want to get a ticket. Number one, to not pay the money, but also just because of the safety issue. So, there is a story of a woman who got a, a Winnebago at the time, and it had this newfangled contraption. It was called cruise control. Have you heard about this? Did you hear that? So she got on the road, and she set the cruise control, and then, because it was a Winnebago, she got up, left the driver's seat, and went to the back to make herself a sandwich. Figured this was just the greatest thing. Of course, you know the outcome, don't you? Yeah, she crashed. And she sued Winnebago. She said, you should have told me, and it should have been clear, that cruise control was not autopilot. It implied that the vehicle would get there itself. How about that? $1.7 million. How many of you just shake your head and go, like, not surprising that somebody actually did that? Now, that's a great sermon illustration. The only problem is it's an urban legend. It never actually happened. <laughs> In fact, there's a whole bunch of stories like that. There are things that never actually happened. But, but how many of you were just sitting there shaking your head going, doesn't surprise me one little bit. And it doesn't surprise me that she got a settlement either. And I think that's a little bit rich coming from people who maybe do the same thing in their walk with Jesus. That we set it on cruise control, or we put it on autopilot, and we just point it in the direction, we feel like we've got to point it pointed in the direction, and we just kind of presume everything's good, and this thing all just is going to happen all by itself. How many of you kind of get what I'm going for here? But we're going to come back to this. First, I want to show you something out of the Word. Let's first of all talk about the followers of Jesus. I'm meditating these days on being intentional in the mission and the mandate of a true biblical faith. Uh, the, the word is actually uh, not intentional, but the biblical word is faithful. To be faithful to the truth and to the journey that we've started. I recounted on Father's Day the story in Matthew 4 of young men who were called by Jesus away from their fishing nets to become fishers of men, and how brave and spectacular it was that they simply dropped what they were doing and went with Jesus. People who went with a teacher like that were called disciples. 
Many teachers of that day had disciples. Jesus wasn't the only itinerant preacher, and he wasn't the only one who had followers. But this was the pattern of learning in their culture. This was the way, this was kind of like uh, going to school or going to college or university and becoming a follower of, of a teacher. And, uh, and those teachers who were really good uh, developed reputations and they developed followings, not only disciples, but whole groups of people who would come out to hear them. So in Matthew chapter 7, we read, When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. So after a similar note to that about the way that the crowds responded, uh, Jesus' uh, ministry starts with a real bang uh, by giving the devil a bloody nose one day in the synagogue. So, so right after he's called his first disciples, we read about it in Mark 1. It says, And just then there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And it did. Verse 27. And listen to the response now. They were all amazed, so that they debated among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. Obviously, they'd heard other teachers before, and this was fairly spectacularly new. This was not like what they had grown accustomed to. And so it says they debated among themselves. And new teaching with authority. He commands even unclean spirits, and they obey him. Immediately, the news about him spread everywhere into all the surrounding district of Galilee. So this was the talk of, of the whole region, what Jesus had done. So before the days of, of mass printing where you could write a book and, and put it out there, before the days of online church and right now media and all those sorts of things, before digital electronics and, and live streaming, teachers had to take their message and they were the ones who moved around. They went from town to town and city to city as itinerant ministers throughout the countryside. Many of the dynamics of this we really don't think about when we're reading the Bible. We're usually listening to content. But the social dynamics of the way this all worked is really the picture for your journey and mine with Jesus. So we're going to take a look at this relationship between Jesus the teacher, his followers, and the people that they were talking to. So, in Luke chapter 8, it says, uh, Soon afterwards, he, speaking about Jesus, began going around. Everyone say, going around. So Jesus, first of all, going around from one city and village to another, proclaiming and preaching the kingdom. So everyone say, proclaiming and preaching. Jesus was going around, proclaiming and preaching. The 12 were with him. Everyone say, with him. So the disciples were with Jesus as he was going around everywhere. And also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Uh, Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. And Joanna, not Johanna, but Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's uh, steward, and Susanna, and many others were contributing to their support out of their own private means. So everyone say contributing support. So here was the relationship dynamics of how this worked. We have a teacher who is itinerant. We have disciples who are traveling with him. And then there is the following of people who are embracing his teaching. And the way they live on the road and move around is that people are contributing to the ongoing ministry and to the repeating of this message by hospitality, by finance, and by supporting the work. Now, that all makes sense, doesn't it? But we usually don't think about these all these things happening, that was how Jesus' ministry was financed. That was how it unfolded. We're going to keep looking into this. So, of course, the disciples would have to travel with Jesus as their teacher, and so they became his entourage. Do you usually think of Jesus having an entourage? 
And the, the people in the entourage had all kinds of responsibilities as their part. This was somewhat uh, prestigious, uh, but it was also a responsible position, helping to organize the meetings, announce the teacher's arrival, to spread the word that he was coming, and they didn't always know what they were doing either. So how many of you could say amen, thank goodness that the Bible records that the disciples of Jesus didn't always know what they were doing? How many of you can relate to being a disciple that doesn't always know exactly what God wants you to be doing? Okay, listen to this in Mark chapter 10. We read this when we do baby dedications. They were bringing children to him so that he might touch them. But the disciples, now let's just hit the pause button. The disciples were about to do something. I think you know what it is. But they must have felt empowered to regulate and navigate what was going on around Jesus in his ministry, right? Because they take it upon themselves to rebuke the parents and the children who, in turn, uh, are now in this awkward position but when Jesus sees it, so this is going on kind of maybe outside of the immediate ministry. So if you think about church and, and say I'm down here ministering to Sandra and I'm praying and there's something going on. I'm not aware of that because I'm ministering to Sandra. But say there's an elder, a deacon, or an usher and they're taking care of things around because my focus is with Sandra in this moment. But Jesus now becomes aware of what's happening and he rebukes them. And he was indignant, it says. So he really told him off. He tore him a new one. You know, so that was a little embarrassing for the disciples because they were supposed to be the guys who knew, but they obviously didn't. And Jesus, of course, says, permit the children to come. So whether through hospitality, so think of, of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, how Jesus, when he went through, would always stay with them. They were like family to him. And they would live with and in and under the hospitality of that family. Or financial port, uh, support mentioned, uh, uh, you can think about uh, people whose lives have been touched, as we read in that one passage already, a woman who's been delivered of seven demons, uh, could be a woman of means. The servant of Herod was probably coming from a, a place of some health but, or wealth. But Joseph of Arimathea, how many of you recognize that name? He was the rich man who supplied the tomb to Jesus that he didn't need very long. <laughs> I, I like that part. And uh, how about Nicodemus, who we also know was a very wealthy man because of when God changed his heart, the uh, Ability to make restitution for those who he had wronged. He paid them back four times what he had taken. And so he obviously had, had wealth as well. So th this was all in support of Jesus the teacher whom they believed in. And so there was, uh, everyone say logistics. <laughs> logistics is the planning and carrying out of all of these tasks that were associated with Jesus. He wasn't just wandering around and he'd start talking and nobody knew who he was or where he was from and what was going on. There, there were announcements, there were pronouncements, there were invitations. All of this stuff was being set up by the entourage and that would have been part of being the disciple of Jesus. And, and because there was finances involved, we are introduced to a particular position within the group of 12 there was a treasurer. Did you know that? <laughs> yeah. How many of you know who the treasurer was? <laughs> yeah. Wrong guy. <laughs> Wrong guy. Of course, we read about it in John chapter 12. And you remember when Mary uh, poured the, the rich perfume on Jesus and washed his feet with her hair and her tears. And there was somebody there. It says in, in uh, John 12, 4, Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples asked this question, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to poor people? Sounds like a good question, if it's truly intended. However, the scripture reveals that it wasn't, uh, not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he had the money box, he was the treasurer, he used to pilfer what was put into it. So Jesus says to Judas, shut up. Leave her alone. And he tells Judas to mind his own business. And I wonder, I'm, I'm pretty sure Jesus knew what was going on. But the large crowd of the Jews then learned that Jesus was there. And they came. 
not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So now Lazarus is going with Jesus and is there and maybe sharing his testimony in this service, in these meetings. But there's a treasurer. There's a position of responsibility for helping this happen. This lens makes the dynamics of many passages in the Bible very interesting to think about. Notice the servant manager role of the disciples. And that when Jesus asked, he expected them to do things. They weren't just passive followers. They weren't on autopilot. They were expected to be facilitators of the work and the ministry of Jesus. So we see this in Mark chapter 6, verse 35. And it says, Jesus' disciples came to him and said, this place where we are is desolate, and is, it's already quite late. What are they doing? They are coming to Jesus and reminding him of the time of the day. They're kind of managing his calendar. Jesus, we know you're caught up in ministry. We know how you love to minister. Do you realize this and this? They're kind of managing him a little bit, managing the meeting. And, uh, and so they suggest to him now a strategy. They're planning. Uh, send them away so that they may go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. And so I would think that it takes a certain amount of confidence to believe that you, have, you should be telling Jesus that, right? So they obviously have permission to come. And he answers them and says, you give them something to eat. And we've talked about this in the past. Jesus didn't actually expect them to feed thousands and thousands of people. The money box was not, not that big. And even if it was, Judas was skimming off the top. <laughs> and there might not have been enough cash left in it. And so, so they said, now, shall we go and spend 200 denarii on bread and give them something to eat? So they're strategizing with Jesus and they're questioning his judgment. So this is a quite interesting dynamic that's going on between them. But then he says, how many loaves do you have? Go look. So now they have an assignment from the master, and they have to go and find out what resources are available in the crowd. And there's precious little. Two loaves, two fish, five loaves. There's just practically nothing there. And then Jesus instructs them, have them sit down. And so now the disciples organize thousands of people into groups and have them sit down. I don't know if what your idea of traveling with Jesus would have been what our imaginations think that would be like, but I think it was fairly busy work. I get the sense that, that there was a lot required of them, and it wasn't just the perk of sitting and listening. Of course, we know what happens in this story. He feeds 5,000. So this is a bit of a glimpse into the dynamic of this itinerant ministry and what it took to make it happen. But there was other things that were happening as well. And they all revolved really around the teaching and around the teacher. Someone uh, commented this week that Jesus was an eminent politician, that he was, of all things that he was, he was a brilliant politician. And uh, before anything else, he was a good politician. And, and I just completely disagree with that. Because there's one, and Pastor Steve and I were having this conversation, there's one title that he's known by, really, throughout the Gospels. Can you think of the, the, the title that he was most often addressed by when people approached him? Rabbi or teacher. Yes. That was what Jesus' ministry was. And he was very good at it. This ministry of Christ teaching ministry was one of the most important aspects of his earthly mission. And immersion in this teaching for the disciples was expected not only by the 12 he called and would ultimately hand his ministry and message over to, but it's also the pattern Jesus establishes for you and I in Matthew 28 in the Great Commission. So listen now to what Jesus says. The 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had designated. So again, they're doing what they're told because that's what disciples do for their teachers. And it says in verse 18, Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples. So let's just stop there. 
What is the word Jesus chooses for those things that we are all about being and making? We are called to be what? What are you? What are you? What are you called to be? This was the paradigm. Just like when Jesus says the relationship between me and my church is like a bridegroom to his fiancée as a newlywed couple. That's the picture of how I relate to you. How you should relate in your calling to Christ is that you are a disciple like this paradigm in the scripture shows you this is what a disciple is. This is the stuff that they did. And he goes on, go make disciples of all the nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Verse 20, teaching them, everyone say teaching, them to observe all. You can say it, I know you want to. Make disciples, teach them to observe all that I have commanded you, and then the beautiful promise, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. It's interesting to note immediately upon calling his first disciples, they followed him through Galilee, listening to him teaching and preaching. And Jesus' last words to them were, go and make disciples and share everything you've heard me teaching and preaching this whole three years that we've been traveling and ministering together. Paul reinforces this in his instruction and in his pattern with Timothy. Remember, Saul didn't meet Jesus, or if he did, he met him as a, as a Pharisee persecuting uh, the church, certainly. But now he's writing to Pastor Tim, and he says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed accurately handling the word of truth. In other words, what? Accurately handling the teaching of the kingdom of God. Timothy 2.2, 2, 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, the things which you have heard from me. Does that sound familiar? This is Paul writing to Timothy. And it's clear that Paul has adopted the same strategy that Jesus used with his disciples. He said, come with me and I will make you fishers of men. Paul said to Timothy, the things you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses... You've been with me. You've heard it over and over again. Entrust these things. I want you now to go do the same thing Jesus did, the same thing I did with you. I want you to go now do... By the way, let me do that again. What Jesus did with his disciples, what Barnabas would do with Saul, who became Paul, what Paul would do to Timothy, he now instructs Timothy to do, and this is how the kingdom grows that we would make disciples, entrust these things to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So we're passing on the teaching and the truth of the kingdom of God. We go from being immersed in the presence of God to being emissaries of God. Now, there were others who were around Jesus' ministry all the time. There were crowds, right? We've, we've heard that. And I think, I think, I, I want to ask you a question. If you had been there in those days, do you think you would have been a part of the crowd or would you have been a disciple? What would you have been? Now keep in mind what a disciple would have to do. It's not just people who came to hear Jesus teaching a nod, yes, amen, that was wonderful. Boy, he teaches as one who's got authority, not like with other stuff we've heard, and then we go home. What's the difference between a member of a crowd and a, and a disciple? How did Jesus call his first disciples? He said, come and follow me, come and be with me, and I will make you a fisher of men. And what did they do? They left their nets, and they left their father, standing on the beach, and they went and they were with Jesus. Can I ask you again, what would you have been? What do you think you'd have done? Would you have been a disciple or been one of the crowd who appreciated his teaching? In Luke 22, Jesus sent Peter and John and said, go and with instructions. He said, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat. And they said, 
where do you want us to prepare it? And he said, and he gave him instructions. And then in verse 13 it said, and they left and found everything just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. They rented the room. They got the food ready. That was what disciples did. They did as the master instructed. They were learning from him by listening carefully to his teaching every day, by doing as they were told. They lived on the road mostly. They would have slept under the stars at times, maybe somewhere halfway between one place and another. Maybe somebody would put them up. Maybe they rented a place for the night. But they were being groomed. They were being taught. They were being established by Jesus to, to follow him, to take up the torch because he knew that his ministry was drawing to a close. They would be his successors. And in part, their credibility would be established by the fact that as they traveled, they would become known as the men who traveled with Jesus, who sat and learned his teachings, and whom Jesus, the teacher, would have passed on all that he was doing. He would entrust it to them. Peter couldn't escape his notoriety at Jesus' trial, as you recall. They looked at him and said, hey, we recognize you. You were one of the men who traveled with Jesus. They recognized him and they recognized those men because Jesus had brought them to the surface. They ran stuff. They did stuff for him. They were connected to him. In Luke chapter 9, verse 57, it says, As they were going along the road, someone came and said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. You see, there's lots of people who make this, this claim that, yes, I want to follow Jesus. But Jesus says, the foxes have holes and the birds have, uh, of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. What's he saying? Are you sure? Because you're going to have to leave your home and you're going to have to live on the road with us. That's what it's going to take. Do you really want to come and follow me? Now, we don't know what this guy did. But Jesus didn't make it easy, did he? And he said to another, uh, follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me first to go bury my father. But he said to him, allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere where the kingdom of God is. Go, go begin to proclaim this. You don't wait. And, and I'm not sure if his father was even sick. I, don't, I, I get the impression from the text that, that this was, that it wasn't like his father was sick or had just died and they just need to do the funeral. It was more like, well, I have responsibilities and so on and so on and so on. And Jesus said, yeah, I know. I know what I'm asking of you. I know what I'm telling you. I know the commitment. But if you want to be my disciple, that's the commitment. That's what it takes. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first permit me to say goodbye. Now, that doesn't seem like, <laughs> that doesn't seem too much. But Jesus said, no one after putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom. Doesn't seem like a particularly friendly answer, does it? How many of you thought, well, that's just, like, just to say goodbye? I would think that he would almost command, make sure you go say goodbye and treat your mother and father with respect and so on. So Jesus doesn't really go out of his way to make this disciple thing easy on people. It says, now after this, the Lord appointed 70 others. So there were at least 70 who had joined. There was at least 70 disciples. So there were people who were leaving their calling, and now they were traveling with Jesus. And it says he sent them out in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. This is the advance crew. They're the advertising, they're the arranging, they're, they're laying things out, and they're proclaiming, Jesus is coming to your town. Come and meet us at this place at this time. So there was an itinerary. Somebody must have planned it because they had to know what to announce. <laughs> How interesting it was to be a disciple of Jesus. You know, Jesus doesn't say you can't join, but he was really clear about the cost. And many who profess significant interest, even publicly, 
would not be willing to pay the price of actually being a disciple. Remember what that, those first young men did to be disciples. They left. They left. Have you left the past? Have you left your family and put Jesus first? Now, you may not have to leave your family to put Jesus first, but for some of you, you did. I didn't have to leave my family. It was already a family of faith. But for some of you, if you proclaim faith in Jesus, it can cost you dearly relationships. It can cost you a marriage. If your spouse doesn't believe and isn't going to support you, that can be the beginning of a difficult time for you. How many of you know that there's a cost and there's a surrender to being a disciple of Jesus? And to that I want to say this then, that there's a difference between believers and disciples. If I could give you one gift today, it would be to strike the idea that you are a Christian from your mind and replace it with the biblical term, disciple of Christ. Crowds dissipate quickly, but disciples remain. Even for the master teacher, Jesus. In John chapter 6, do you remember when he preached the message about eating his flesh and drinking his blood? Do you remember the reaction? Many people said, this is a hard teaching. And it says, after that, many people no longer followed him. They said, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? But Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. So Jesus did know about Judas. As a result of this, many, even of his disciples, withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. I wonder how often that's been repeated since this text was first written. That, Jesus, you're asking a difficult thing. I don't know if I can do that. It's a hard thing, and I don't know if I can keep walking that journey. How many of you have known someone who, when they faced the trials of life, began to question their faith? began to question the goodness of God that we sang about, by the way, thank you, Terry and worship team, for putting our focus. This is why the disciples stayed with Jesus. They recognized who he was. Because he asked them, do you want to go away also to his 12? And Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? There's no place else to go. You have the words of life. The teachings that you, we've been listening to are transforming and are powerful. They set people free. They've healed the sick. We've heard your words raise the dead. Where else are we supposed to go to find that? There was no place else. And then Jesus reminds them, did I myself not choose you? And yet one of you is a devil. I think there's an encouragement here for us. Jesus would remind you and me today, did I not choose you and call you to be my disciple, to come alongside of me and walk with me in ministry in the kingdom of God? He ends the Great Commission by saying, Lo, I am with you always. I called you and I'm still with you. And I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. When Jesus says, teach him to observe all, he's not meaning to observe as in step back and watch. And I think we've, I, I don't know, I, I'm just curious, has the North American church sat back to watch? Is North American Christianity on autopilot? But it doesn't mean to observe. It means to observe in the same way a police officer would tell you, I want you to observe all of the laws of the road doesn't just mean watch them, it means do them. Read them and do them. And so this is a part of our discipleship, to not only read the words and not only believe that they're true or believe that Jesus is the Son of God, but to follow him and to do them and to actually help promote them. 
All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good belief. No. Equipped to think right. No. Equipped for what? For every good work. These are works that God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The, the life of the disciple in the gospel of the disciples was filled with work. Things that they did as part of Jesus' ministry. James 1 reminds us, prove yourselves to be doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. So let me challenge you this morning. Don't be part of the crowd. Be a disciple of Christ. It's obvious that God expects his disciples to put into practice the things that he teaches us. The desire and the power to do it comes from the Holy Spirit. That's how we know we're born again. Because as we abide in him and his word abides in us, it says we bear much fruit. There are works that come out of that. Romans reminds us with the heart we believe resulting in righteousness and with the mouth we confess resulting in salvation. Confession and belief that result in fruitfulness, that result in good works. May I ask you humbly, do you have the will and desire to follow Jesus? That is the word that Jesus uses. He said, go make disciples. He didn't say, don't make Christians. He didn't say, make Christians. He didn't say, go and try to create a group of believers. He didn't say, assemble a crowd. He said, go and make disciples. Matthew 7, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, a good tree cannot produce bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. So who enters the kingdom of heaven? He who does the will of my Father. He who does the stuff. I want to talk with you in conclusion about what I'm just going to call the drift. The drift. Throughout history, not only people, but the church in general has demonstrated a tendency to drift from the anchor of what God has instructed. It's time for a distinction. I worry that the church has established a different concept and mission than Jesus gave. That we're working at something that is not biblical. And I've shared it already with you. What is Christianity on autopilot? It's a Christian who professes Christ but doesn't know how to worship or pray. It's a person who says they are a Christian but doesn't read the word or know it or study it or live it. It's a person who says that they're a part of the church but they have no ministry and they do no work and they, don't, they haven't found their place to participate in the promotion of the kingdom of God, to see people become disciples, to be a part of that process of people coming to know who Jesus is, committing their lives to him, repenting of sin, surrendering their life to Jesus and learning to walk in the ways of God. Can I ask you this morning, what is your ministry? What is the work that you do? How do you go about it? And I'm not telling you you have to answer to me. And I'm not telling you it has to be in some kind of a ledger somewhere within the walls of an organizational church. I'm just asking you, what's the thing God's called you to do? And are you doing it with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Are you building and helping to build the kingdom? Are you helping to make disciples? Because that's what he's called us to. Imagine that driving analogy we started out with. Remember the Winnebago lady story? Um, which wasn't true, but imagine now if you're on the road and you're going to drive home, but as you're driving home, you're on a road and it's going west, and it begins to move, and it starts turning itself to the north. So you're still on the road. Your wheels are still going in the 
same direction, but the road has moved. Well, that's just stupid, isn't it? Let's pick a different analogy. How many of you have swimming? You like swimming. Or you've, you've flown. You've flown. It's interesting because when you're swimming or flying, you can be moving in a direction relative to the medium that you're in, but the whole medium can be moving at the same time. So imagine you're swimming and you're tired and you want to swim towards the shore. Here I am and there's the shore. Here's the deep end. And I'm swimming and I'm, an average person can swim about three kilometers an hour. So we're swimming about three kilometers an hour. And if the water isn't moving, how fast will I be going? And which direction will I be going? That way, right? Right down the middle of the front aisle. And, and I'll get to the shore. No problem. But what if there's a tide? So I'm swimming in the water, but the water is moving too. So if I'm swimming three kilometers an hour, let's do the dog paddle. And the tide, oh, sorry. Where am I supposed to be? Wherever I want to be. Okay, you'll hit me. All right. But the tide is also coming in at five kilometers an hour. How fast am I moving? I'm moving eight kilometers an hour. I'm really, really rolling, man. I'm doing, nah, I'm doing the crawl, man. Here we go. Olympic swimmer. Phelps is a little taller than me. But, and he's got webbed fingers. I don't know. Anyway. So I'm doing eight kilometers, and will I get to my destination? Absolutely. In fact, I'll get there sooner. But what if the tide is going out at five kilometers an hour? And I'm swimming three kilometers an hour, and I'm trying to get there. Which direction am I actually moving? I am swimming this way, but I'm losing ground. Because the, the medium that I'm in is drifting. Same thing for flying. I want to fly due west. And I can... Aim, according to my compass in my aircraft, due west. But there's a wind blowing from the south, and it's going 30 kilometers an hour. If I travel for one hour, aim due west, but there's a 30-kilometer crosswind, in one hour, how far will I be from the point of my destination? I'll be 30 kilometers. So while I'm moving this direction, I'm actually traveling this direction. I'm on a tangent, right? Because the air is moving. The water is moving. And that's why you and I need to understand what it means to be a disciple in this age. There is no autopilot. You can't just set the controls and expect it to take you to the destination because you're in a moving environment. Culture is a moving environment. It's drifting. How many of you have seen and see the drift of culture? And that means that we can't be asleep at the wheel. We have to make course corrections. If I'm in an aircraft and the wind is blowing that way, what direction do I actually have to head to get to the camera? I actually have to be headed this way because I'll be headed flying if the wind stopped. I'd be flying this way, but the wind is pushing me. So I'm flying that way against the wind, but I'm actually going to make it to my destination. Have you figured out that you need to adjust your course in Christian living according to the drift of the culture and the ideas that swirl around us? How many of you here are over 50 years old today? And I only ask that because... I want to embarrass you. No. I want to ask, how much has the world changed in 50 years? From the world I grew up in as a kid in school, in high school? And guess what? If you're 15, how many of you are 15 years of age or 20 years of age and younger this morning? 20 years and younger? You'll be saying the same thing. It's not, don't tell me I sound old, buddy. Don't you dare. <laughs> I mean, I do. I sound old, but don't you say it. Because you're going to find the same words coming out of your mouth if the Lord tarries that long. Do you know it's because of this that the church has had to establish the truth in something that we call the creeds. How many of you have heard of the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed? Do you know why the creeds were necessary? 
They were necessary because of thoughts and doctrines and ideas that were beginning to undermine the very foundation of who Jesus is and what he taught. And so the creeds were designed to help anchor the truth. You see, the water, the tide can come and go, but if you can drop an anchor into the bedrock, into the soil, into the bottom of the ocean, you won't drift in the tides of your generation. We don't drift. The church doesn't drift because the teaching is moving. It drifts because our perception of truth changes. I think of a scripture verse in Romans 1 where it says, professing to be wise, we can become fools. Thinking we're smart. And there have been all kinds of trends. And think about the spiritual dynamics of the world. We have God and we have the enemy, Satan, who wants to destroy anything that God made or loves. We would be foolish not to believe that there are not demons and thoughts and ideas that are specifically designed to untether us and unanchor us and see if, it, if he can't get the church to begin drifting and losing the teaching. I want to talk with you, I think, probably in days or weeks to come about what disciples are and what they do and how to be a disciple. But for today, I just, I just want... I just want to talk about this. How do I know that there's drift? Because there's always drift. <laughs> there's always been drift. The first drift started in a conversation between Satan and Eve. The first little veering off of truth. And look what happens. Hmm. To stop or not to stop? Give me a call, Steve. Not my, not your job. <laughs> Fair enough. Hmm. The, the impact of what I'm talking about this morning is really far-reaching. For you as a believer, but also for us as a church. Because I think there's two ways to approach church. Church gatherings, church organizing, being disciples. One is that we cater to the crowd. Because that's what the crowd wants. They want to be able to hear the teaching of Jesus and have the impact of his ministry in their lives, but they don't want to leave their life, their past. And Christians like that become consumers. They come for their weekly booster shot, maybe on Sunday morning or whatever it is. But there's another way of being a church, and that is to consider what our mandate is. And what Jesus said is, go and make disciples. And Jesus offended crowds left and right. He offended people. And they, I'm just curious, what would be your response? What will be your response? If I say to you, brother, sister, what you're doing, this thing that you call your Christian journey, it's not good enough. I mean, you know, what right do I have? But I'm just, you think about it uh, metaphorically or... But if I say, you know, you don't have the marks of, all the marks of a disciple. There's, there's things. How can I help you? I'm not going to let you stay where you're at. What if we start talking to that way to each other? I'm not going to let you stay where you're at. I'm not going to let you gonna stay broken. I'm not going to let you go to church on Sunday and weep at the altar and go partying on Saturday night or whatever. I'm going to start saying, brother, these things ought not to be. What do we do if we actually make being disciples the goal? 
It's not good enough that you gave your heart to Jesus Sunday morning. Good, good start, great stuff. I mean, yes, you're born again and so on, but now we need to complete the work. And so we need to show you what it means to walk with Jesus, what it means to be able to leave your nets and your family if need be, to put Jesus first. And we require every church member to be involved in a ministry of some kind somewhere, in the community, in the church, wherever. Just find a spot and get, get, get your hands, get your sleeves rolled up and get your hands dirty and learn, learn on the go. The disciples didn't know what they were doing a bunch of times, right? Jesus had to rebuke them. It says he was incensed with them. <laughs> we make mistakes. But what are we doing here? All right, I think that's enough. <laughs> On that happy note, yay, happy Canada Day. And hey, everything's opening up. And, oh. <laughs> Good grief. You know, th- you know, this last two minutes, three minutes, this is going to be one of those ones where I go home and go, what were you thinking? What? That was not written at the script at the end. You had it. It just, oh. Are you guys okay? Bring it on. You want it? Okay. About 600 before COVID. About 600 for Sunday morning. About 1,000 affiliated. Not everyone here always at the same time. Here's the question, and here's what I'd like you to pray with me. Let's pray that 1,000 or all 600 who are here on a given Sunday morning, that all of them would find their way back to the feet of Jesus to embrace the teaching and the life of being a disciple of Christ in this world. I know it's hard. We've got a lot of things to learn about doing this better. But would you pray with me? You can start by being one of them. This morning, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, I want to give you that opportunity. It means, and you've heard what it means to be a disciple. But Jesus is the one who created this world, and he's the one who's going to come back and rule it. And we have a decision to make. We have a decision to make. Whose side are you going to be on? Whose side do you want to be on? And only the Holy Spirit can lead you to this decision. I know this, though, that we sang songs this morning that God is good. And he loves you. And he sent his son to save you. And to make you into what he knew you would be. Wanted you to become. When the idea of you was birthed in his being. Who knows when ago. If you're ready to make that kind of a decision, then I want to ask you to bow your head and pray with me. And maybe those of you who are here in the sanctuary would just pray out loud with me. Um, This is a simple prayer. You make it your own from your heart. And this is the beginning of the journey of discipleship. Pray, Lord Jesus, I thank you for coming to this world to reconcile us back into relationship with God. We thank you for your word that teaches us who you are and what you've done for us. I accept the word of truth that tells me that I am born in sin. But Lord, today I want to confess my sin. And I want to surrender my life to you. Thank you for dying on the cross, for wiping out my sin debt, and for coming back to life and giving me the gift of eternal life through you, Jesus. I commit today to learning what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. I thank you for the promise of your spirit and your help to be able to walk it out. And I thank you that you are faithful and will bring to pass all things according to your will concerning my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, you've begun a journey 
that's an exciting adventure. And with a group of people who will love you completely as they drive you crazy. <laughs> but that's part of the story. Amen. Let's all stand together. Another thing that disciples do is they pray. They pray for one another and they come to God and they say, Lord, touch me, lay hands on me, heal me. I don't know what you need this morning. But if you have a need, I want you to raise your hand. You're going to come to Jesus. You're going to say, okay, disciples, they come to Jesus. That's what we do. Okay, I'm, I'm here. So, Jesus, here I stand. Next week, we're going to lay hands on you, and we're going to hug you if you let us, and all that stuff. But this morning, you're just going to raise your hand. And we're going to pray. Lord Jesus, I'm standing here. Go ahead, pray it. Lord Jesus, I'm standing here. And you know what I need. And you know what's happening in my body and in my relationships, and in my family, and in my finances. Lord, you know everything. And Jesus, I'm asking you for help in these areas of my life. And Lord, I lift this request to you. Now you just say in your heart and in your spirit what your request is. Just speak it. Speak it right to him. Lord Jesus, hear the prayers. Hear the offerings of your people. We come to you like Peter said. Where else can we go? You have the words that give life. And so, Jesus, we're asking you. We're, we want to begin and dare to believe for a biblical discipleship and a biblical expression of faith and the power of God moving among his people. So, Lord, we claim these promises by faith in the name of Jesus. And if you're here together with someone... Can you just agree with them right now? If you're here with a family member, just say, here's what I've prayed for. Will you agree and say amen with me? We're going to believe for this together. Okay? So just take a moment to do that. Just get someone to agree with you together. Say, here's what I prayed. Here's what I prayed. Here's what I'm asking God for. Fathers with sons, husbands with wives, moms with kids. Here's what I'm praying for. Go ahead. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Okay. Now you're getting quiet. So, at the end of a prayer, we affirm that we are together in this and we agree together in Jesus' name by a beautiful word. And all the people said, Amen. Amen which means... I agree, so be it. Right? Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Go be disciples. <laughs> right, Sandra? Let's go be disciples.